Hi, everyone. Welcome to Let's Talk. Our session today is from Research to Action, Sharing the Science of Early Development. I'm Debbie Mathias from the BUILD Initiative and the director of the QRIS National Learning Network. Before we begin our session, I'd like to thank the Alliance for Early Success and other generous funders for making this learning community possible. We began this series for state quality administrators and leaders to support their essential work within states around quality early learning systems building. Today, we have colleagues registered from over 28 states and territories. We intentionally keep the sessions small to invite conversation and sharing. We hope these calls enable us to illuminate challenges, innovation, and promising practices. We're interested in your questions, ideas, and thoughts, as Jonathan said at the beginning, throughout the session. So please enter into the chat, chat box or Q&A as something strikes you. If you have a resource to share from your state or work, please include it in the link. During this Let's Talk, we'll explore an initiative to share cutting edge brain and developmental science and discuss how the initiative can best meet your needs. We'll learn how two states, New Hampshire and Nevada are using this science to address school readiness and family engagement. We'll also share information about the free resources Mind in the Making and Vroom teams have created and are creating. We want to hear from you about your professional development needs and discuss how new materials from Mind in the Making in Varun could most be useful to you in your existing professional development systems and supporting family engagement and partnerships. Throughout the session, as an idea strikes you, we'd like you to add it and the possible use of materials um, into the chat box. We hope that we have an opportunity to discuss questions and ideas after the session sparks conclude. Now a little bit about our session contributors. First, Ellen Galinsky is the Chief Science Officer and Executive Director of Mind in the Making at the Bezos Family Foundation. She also serves as President of Families and Work Institute. She's the author of the best-selling book, Mind in the Making, and she's currently, yay, working on a book about adolescence titled The Breakthrough Years. My grandkids are getting into those years. Erin Ramsey is the Senior Manager for Mind in the Making at the Bezos Family Foundation. She's responsible for the overall implementation and development of partnerships for Mind in the Making. Dan Torres is the Senior Program Manager at the Bezos Family Foundation, and he supports and cultivates partnerships for the Vroom Program. Before Bezos, he was the Executive Director of the Washington State Essentials for Early Childhood Initiative, a cross-system public-private partnership. Jackie Cole is the Executive Director of the Early Learning of Early Learning New Hampshire. She also serves as the ad Executive Director of the New Hampshire Coalition for Business and Education and is a member of the Governor's Council for Thriving Children. Celissa Hoyt is the State Director of the State Early Learning Alliance and of Room and Mind in the Making. She's consulted with emerging shared service groups around the country to help others find innovative ways to increase resources for early childhood programs. Finally, Marty Elquist is the Department Director of Supporting Early Education and Development at the Children's Cabinet of Nevada. Marty is the Nevada Early Childhood Advisory Council Chair and has served on the National NACRA Board. Well, without further ado, we have so much um, content to share with everyone. I'd like to turn it over to Ellen Galinsky. Thank you so much, Debbie. And um, I'm here joined by the photographs of our team, our grandchildren, our children, um, and in um, nieces uh, and nephews as well. I'm going to share the science of early learning and how we've um, 
brought it to action at the Bezos Family Foundation. Mind in the Making is an ongoing effort, it's 20 years old now, to curate the science of children's brain development and learning and to share it with the general public, everyone who can uh, use it and who can uh, turn this research into action. And Broom, as you will hear from Dan later, is a complementary effort uh, to share the science, to put the brain science in the hands of caregivers, uh, of teachers, and of parents, the people who can use it most. Uh, okay, that's my cute grandson. Um, this is a research journey uh, that I'm going to take you on today quickly uh, because it's a 20 year journey, but it started with a question, which is how to keep that fire for learning burning in children's eyes. That is a, on a day that I came back from uh, an airplane trip and brought him an airplane and you can see how sparkly his eyes are. All children are born learning and yet uh, national research is showing that between 40 and 60% of kids are not engaged in learning as they're older. Uh, what are we doing as a society and how can we prevent that from happening? Because we believe so strongly that the opportunity gap uh, and the achievement gap are influenced by this. So that's actually uh, one of my bookshelves. And when I had a question in 2000, I turned to the science um, and looked at what the science could say about early learning and about the engagement in learning. Because if we're going to understand this, we need to start with our youngest children. So our question in 2001 was, how do parents actually want to hear about the learning? Um, we knew what we wanted to say, or we're beginning to know that, but how did parents want to hear that? And uh, as you will hear later, communicating is one of the skills that we think are important. We need to have the perspective of others. So we put together uh, with zero to three focus groups of families. Uh, there's one in Baltimore that was uh, life-changing for me. We had asked that question, we were behind the windows uh, so that we could see the people talking but they couldn't see us and there was a facilitator there but one of the women turned straight to the windows and she said you you researchers first you tell us to drink red wine and then you tell us not to drink red wine and then you tell us to eat red meat and then you tell us not to eat red meat i want to know who these researchers are and i want to know how they know uh, what they know about my child or my children and that was you're exactly right in the past, most researchers were, you know, speaking as if the voice of God, you know, this is what we know. Um, we needed to take people on virtual trips to the labs of researchers where you meet them as people and where you learn what they know. So that changed everything. I then set out with a, a camera crew and um, for the next really nine, 10 years, actually, I continue to do it, have gone around the country filming research in action. So here's the, here are the early childhood people we have filmed to date. Uh, yes, Debbie, there's a whole group of adolescent researchers uh, if we were going to make a list of that, but here are the people whom we filmed and interviewed. We've read a lot more research than this, but these are just the films. So I'm gonna share five findings. And the first is that the beginning is really the beginning. In the past, every early childhood conference I'd gone to was named something like starting smart or uh, the early years or learning years or uh, learning begins at birth or names like that, but it wasn't really getting through. And I think it took uh, the brain science, which we began to share in 1993 with the release of the Carnegie uh, Corporation's report starting points. It was the brain science that made it visible. And the reason that it made it visible was that you could actually see those brain cells changing. Um, when it was invisible, it didn't seemed to make much sense. But when it became visible, it made a lot of sense. And, and if I were showing you this video, you would go to the lab of Sam Wang at Princeton, and you would see how he studies synaptic connections, neurons, neurons connecting to each other that form the foundation for how we learn and who we are as people, both now and in the future. The second message is um, the importance of relationships. And if I were to show you this video, it would be of the still face. Some of you may have uh, seen this video um, in your journey in early childhood in the past. Uh, that mother is sitting face to face in the lab of Edtronic um, with her six month old child, Mackenzie. And uh, first she's reacting to her child the way she normally does. Then she turns, is told by Edtronic to turn her head away. 
Uh, he's at the University of Boston, I mean, of Massachusetts at Boston. And then she's to turn back, but keep a still face. You can see how she's working really hard to keep, keep a still face. If you saw her on video, she'd be smiling some of the time because uh, it's really hard. Um, and Mackenzie at first just tries to reach out to her the way she normally does, but then that doesn't work. So she begins to flare her arms and fuss and, and e even yell. Um, and then she just slumps, she just gives up. What that uh, experiment shows is that when we stop everyday action and reduce it to its, its essentials and, and Edtronic stopped that mother from the way she normally interacts with her child, you can see what's really important. And what's really important are relationships. Um, I don't know if you remember the election where everybody said it's the economy, stupid. I often say it's relationships. I don't know if I'll say stupid but it's relationships. And that is even more apparent with um, the research that I'm now doing on adolescents, where we've asked adolescents if they had one wish and just one wish to improve online learning, what would it be? And um, the largest proportion of adolescents said more interaction. Even though we're online, we still need those relationships. And we also found in that study that the kids who felt known, who felt understood, who felt cared about, um, so care is always a part of teaching, even when you're in adolescence, are the kids who maintain their, their, um, their school engagement. Um, and that was important because over COVID, uh, engagement and learning uh, plummeted. So relationships uh, are key to learning. And Edtronic shows that those moments when we're in sync with children, which are only about 20 to 30% of the time, um, are how we learn. And that, if you go to the next slide, I'm going to take you to the University of Washington um, and show you back and forth interactions with Patricia Cool, uh, because that turn taking is an essential strategy. If you move to the next slide, um, you'll see Pat Cool's lab. Um, that little baby is 11 months old. Her name is Alady, and her mom is sitting uh, face to face with her, except for Alady is in this machine that Pat Cool describes as looking like a hairdryer from Mars. Um, and it's taking a movie, an actual movie of her brain in action. And it's showing that when the mom, in this case, the mom, it could be the dad, it could be the teacher, anyone who's important, the grandmother or the grandfather, is going back and forth, turn taking, serve and return, uh, the Harvard Center calls it, with the child, that's when learning takes place. That's what builds the brain. This experiment is showing something else that's important, which is that um, it's not just the auditory sections of the brain that lights up. Those are the uh, words in red on your screen in the picture below. It's also the Broca area. And the Broca area of the brain is the part of the brain that we use to rehearse how we're going to act. Like if we're getting ready to walk into a room, we'll rehearse it in the Broca area of our brain. Um, it helps us, the brain get ready to do something. And in this case, to speak. So even before uh, Elodie is able to speak, her brain is rehearsing the actions that she'll need to speak. The other thing that's happening during this really early period is that Elodie and all other children are learning how people think about them and how people think about the group that they're in. And that starts as early as three months as uh, studies in Canada uh, show. It, it goes up to six to nine months where children are more likely to look at the faces of people from their own race than the faces of others if they see them on a screen. And they're more likely to look at the face if there's an uncertain situation that's being shown on the screen um, and to pair faces from their own race to uh, happy music versus uh, other races for sad music. So they're already, even before they can talk, forming fe feelings about who they are and who they're going to become. And that's really important in helping uh, kids build a positive racial identity. They're drawn to people like them, so they're looking very carefully at how people think of other people like them. In Elodie's case, she's also a girl. So um, how do people feel about girls? Um, and, um, and she's figuring that out too. Um, so um, what we say about, and, or what we do about how we feel about our own children and others, and I'll talk about praise later on, makes a difference in developing a, pos pos a positive racial and cultural identity. The next uh, thing that's important are executive functions. Um, many of you have heard me say that 
when I first heard executive functions, I thought of some guy in a pinstripe suit bossing you around in your brain. It's probably because I did research on corporations, um, but it's not that. It's the part of the brain that manages our social, our emotional, and our cognitive capacities so we can achieve goals. If you go to the next slide, you can see academic papers that show that. Um, it's uh, a top-down neurocognitive attentional process that uh, always comes into play when we're solving goal, uh, uh, addressing goals and trying to solve problems so that we can reach our goals. And it involves our social, our emotional, and our cognitive capacities. So those of you who think of social emotional learning know that that's a name that adults made up, but in real life, social and emotional and cognitive learning when kids are really engaged uh, go together. If you could move to the next slide. Um, executive functions involve three capacities, which is working memory, holding the information that you have in mind so that you can use it. Um, use it flexibly, cognitive flexibility. Think of the COVID period that we're in right now. Um, we need to adapt to changing circumstances. Those who do uh, are faring a lot better than those who don't. And uh, we need to um, use inhibitory control or self-control, not to go on automatic, but do what we need to do to achieve a goal. That, those are the core aspects of executive function skills. If you move ahead, you will see that these are important in school readiness and school success. And on the next slide, I show studies that show um, this, is, this is a synthesis of, of the research that the Harvard Center on the Developing Child did uh, that show that it's absolutely central, front and center to learning. We think of learning so often as learning stuff, colors, uh, names, um, numeracy, literacy, uh, those sorts of things, science. Um, but it's really also, we're learning how to learn uh, both in the early years and, and onward. We're all learning that now and adapting to COVID. Um, the Harvard Center calls executive function skill the air traffic controller of the brain. Uh, other people call it the orchestra. Um, and it pulls together these capacities uh, so that we can achieve goals. If you move forward, a study shows that it predicts academic success. And if you move forward, there's a study that I've always liked by Megan McClellan. This study is particularly important because uh, it showed that four-year-olds who had what is called attention span persistence were almost 50% more likely um, to um, graduate from college when they were 25 years old. And you just don't find statistics like that in normal everyday life. That is really powerful. It was so powerful that it, uh, that it turned Megan McClellan from studying uh, twins um, who were adopted to see what affected how they turned out. It turned her into now uh, studying executive functions, which she's continued to do. Okay, it's also important in the next slide um, for school, for uh, job readiness and, um, and workforce success, which is a very big issue in all of the states. If you move forward, uh, here's a study that I really love. It's the National Association of Colleges and Employers. Every year they do a job outlook survey where they ask employers what they're looking for, most importantly, in candidates for new jobs, uh, communication skills, problem solving skills, ability to work in a team, initiative. Uh, those are the most important things that they're looking for. It's uh, goes way beyond grades and your SAT scores. Uh, uh, employers are really looking uh, for these skills and they feel that they have to spend a lot of money to teach them to people if they don't have them um, or they're less likely to hire people who don't seem to have them. Let's move forward. Um, this is a study uh, also that I really like. It was done in Dunedin, New Zealand. Um, I've been to Dunedin, New Zealand, so I always get a warm picture of my time there. Uh, they took every child, about a thousand plus children who were born in one particular year, and they followed them uh, with multiple, multiple measures of how they were doing uh, over 32 years. And they found that kids who have self-control at four years old uh, were more likely to be healthier and wealthier and less likely to get into trouble when they were 32 years of old. Importantly, they controlled for socioeconomic status and IQ. And those are the things that usually predict how kids turn out. So this is over and above um, the social address that you're born with or the IQ uh, that you have. Um, in fact, they did a study of siblings and they found that siblings who were raised uh, to have more self-control uh, were also likely to do better. So this is something that can be taught if you move ahead. Um, uh, it's really important as our what we call skill building strategies and this is based on the research on autonomy support. If you move forward, if I showed you the video that's on the next side, 
Uh, you would see my adorable grandson. Those are his hands. He it doesn't usually get to star in videos, but he was such a Lego fiend that we used him uh, in this video uh, that we did of Stephanie Carlson um, and how she measures what is called autonomy support in the research. She had been looking for a long time about what do teachers, what do families do that promote executive function skills? And she found it was what is called in the literature autonomy support. We call it skill building strategies. And it means essentially that adults uh, don't fix problems for kids. They help children gain the skills, in other words, skill building strategies to learn to fix them for themselves. If you move forward, uh, you will see that autonomy support research has been very predictive of executive function skills. Uh, and it's over and above uh, children's uh, um, beyond parents' own EF skills. In other words, this isn't just inherited. It can be taught, which is really important. I did that study in part with Stephanie Carlson and others, and I'm really proud of that study because we answered a, 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 an important question in the field. Um, here are the aspects of skill building strategies. Um, I'm going to not go through them in detail. Um, we'll leave them. Uh, for you to see when you look back at them, but just share that, that understanding why kids act the way that they do, uh, sharing reasons, not just pick up your room, but um, why you pick up your room, ensuring that the child plays an active role with choices and, and uh, shared solutions, uh, which is a process that we've developed for uh, uh, children, not just uh, having problems fixed for them, but for having uh, being able to uh, have uh, learned the skills to fix their own problems. And finally, scaffolding, which is, as you know, uh, helping them learn uh, to do things as stretching them, but only to the extent that they're still safe. That scaffold is up, and then as they become safe to do things on their own, you remove that scaffold and set another stretch goal. Um, I believe strongly after now <clears throat> lots of years of doing the research before I did this research review, and then the 20 years that I've looked at the research that if we're really gonna make a difference in readiness and success all along the life cycle, we need to promote executive function skills and skill building strategies because they we can intervene there, we can make a difference. So if you move ahead, here are the seven skills, the seven life skills uh, that are uh, we found are very important. Um, and uh, these all are based on executive function skills. Uh, we describe the very, very specific ways that they are uh, in the modules that we've developed. For, for example, to understand how someone else thinks and feels perspective taking, you have to remember what you feel, you have to remember what someone else feels, you have to uh, be flexible, you're not now just focusing on your own uh, views, but you're focusing on someone else's thoughts and feelings, and you have to go on automatic and not just uh, assume that what you feel is what everybody feels but understand how what someone else in a different culture from a different race, uh, from a different country, uh, from a different background, uh, just uh, a, from a different gender, from a different age, might be thinking and feeling. Uh, it is the skill that is most important in reducing conflict. So focus and self-control. Um, we show the picture of the marshmallow test because it's really a wonderful experiment in executive function. There's a plate um, in front of that little girl she can see two marshmallows on one side and one marshmallow on the other. So the environment is going to be reliable. She's given a choice of waiting for, um, and she waits and it's 15 minutes, so it's a long time for a four-year-old. If she can wait, she'll get two marshmallows, but if she can't wait, she can have the one marshmallow now. And what is wonderful, one of the factors in helping focus and self-control is that we can help children develop their own strategies. After um, Walter Michelle did this study, he then spent the rest of his career um, studying the strategies that we use uh, to um, have focus and self-control or self, -gratif self delayed gratification. Let's move on to perspective taking. And I've already defined that. And let's move on to the next picture. Um, this uh, is a study that Alison Gopnik did. And she shows that, um, that this experiment uh, has a picture of crayons on the box. But what's really inside are paper clips. And um, if you look at the box with a picture of crayons on the outside, a, a four-year-old child is likely to say uh, there are crayons inside. But when they, it's opened up, he can see that they're actually paper clips. And then Allison Gopnik says, what do you think your friend over there is going to think is in the box? And the child who can take the perspective of others will know 
that the child will think that they're crayons, even though they're really paper clips inside. The child who hasn't learned that yet. And again, remember this, these skills develop over time and they can be promoted. Um, so a child who has not developmentally ready to learn this skill and it hasn't been promoted and or it hasn't been promoted, um, will think that the that uh, the other child will think they're paper clips in the box. If you move ahead, communicating is the next skill. And if you move ahead, here's an experiment that Kathy Hirsch Pasek and others did. Um, it was during the time of when everyone was talking about the six million uh, word gap. I'm sorry, the 30 million word gap, um, and thinking that if you just talk, 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 children would hear all those words. Uh, the analogy of pouring words into an empty vessel. But I've already told you from Pat Cool's research that children are not empty vessels. They are active in their own learning. And it's through that back and forth that matters. And in fact, um, Kathy hirsch Pasek and her colleagues, and later on, uh, Rachel Romeo and uh, John Gabrielli have found that it's turn taking that makes the biggest difference. If we move ahead, the next style is making connections. And if we go ahead, I'll show you um, an experiment there. Um, it um, making connections may sound like not as clear a skill as perspective taking or focus and self control, but it really is, it underlines all of symbolic representation. Um, in other words, knowing that a word will stand for a concept that stands for something real in life, like those um, um, pieces of a puzzle held up uh, stand for how let's say four pieces of a puzzle and that you can see them in real life. You can see the number four and therefore you can see the numeracy word uh, written out for four and know uh, that they all sound for an amount of things. Um, and in this study, um, two researchers at Carnegie uh, Mellon found that, uh, that if you have children play games, uh, but play the games in a different way, um, you can teach a lot about numeracy. For example, when you spin the spinner, something so simple and something that we all automatically do, when you spin the spinner and you're already on six and you get two ahead, instead of saying one, two, which I think we all do, um, they taught the children to say seven, eight, which are the two numbers ahead. And kids who did that were much more likely to understand larger than, smaller than, to understand the sequence of numbers. Um, and uh, to really gain critical skills that these particular kids were lacking um, in, in uh, numerical understanding. If we move ahead, the next skill is critical thinking. And I'm gonna go ahead now um, to say that in an election season um, where so many people believe different things, how do you know if the information that you're hearing on the media is actually true and how would you figure that out and um, what um, this research is done by Laura Schultz at MIT, and she found if we tell the answers too quickly to children um, that they're not going to continue to explore and wonder. In other words, we're taking curiosity away from them. This was a jack in the box, and if we show them how it works, they move on to another bright, shiny object, another toy. So um, our question, answer, question, answer, not letting children have a chance to reflect and figure out the answers for themselves is really one of the things that's turning off the fire in children's uh, eyes. Um, you, you saw uh, the research of Alison Gopnik before, but she found in one study, I just love this finding, that even a teacher saying, I wonder, uh, changed the learning in the class. These things are so simple and they're everyday things that don't cost any money if you move ahead. Uh, to the next slide, I think that taking on challenges is one of the most critical uh, skills. If you move to the next slide, um, it is not just resilience. You know, we've we've focused a lot on kids and resilience, particularly during a stressful time like COVID. But it's more than resilience. It's taking action. It's not just getting up if you if you fall off a bike, but it's getting back on that bike and and riding it. Um, so uh, that's the skill that we want to teach to children, uh, being able to, uh, to take on a challenge, to do something that's hard. Uh, this is the research of Carol Dweck. You probably, a lot of you know about the growth mindset and um, a fixed mindset. The growth mindset means that you, are, uh, you believe that you're capable of learning. It's a, a, an implicit assumption you have about yourself versus a fixed mindset, which is the assumption that you're born with the intelligence that you already have. She's found that the way that we praise children make a difference. 
again, something so simple that everybody can do. And our tips uh, for room and, and many of the materials that we've made share hundreds of strategies, uh, factors that matter from the research. She's found that if you praise children not for you are so smart, which reinforces the, the, the fixed mindset, but if you praise them for, and not for good job because that's indiscriminate and not specific praise, but if you praise them for things like you tried hard and in trying hard, you kept turning the pieces of that puzzle around till you found the two yellow uh, pictures that go together. That is, you pay, praise them specifically for their strategy, they're more likely to have uh, a growth mindset, which makes a big difference in children's achievement. The last um, skill is actually the sum of them all. It's social, emotional, and cognitive learning. And I, every researcher I interviewed, uh, I said, um, tell me about um, social, emotional, and cognitive learning. Um, are they separate or do they go together? And, and if so, how? Uh, because there was so much emphasis on social and emotional learning um, with the assumption that it was somehow different from cognitive learning. It is cognitive learning at its core. Remember, these are neurocognitive processes. And I have just snippets of every researcher um, whom I interviewed saying this, that we that it's academically we separate these out, but it's not the way the brain works in, in real life. So we need to appeal to children's social and emotional cognitive. Um, so now we know all this stuff, you know, it's 2005, we've been out for five years um, filming the research, 15 more to go, and I didn't know that then, but um, we wondered how best to translate the science uh, to action in training materials. Um, so much of training is I'm going to tell you something, and uh, and here's what I'm now telling you, and then I've told you, and that's not how people learn. If you move ahead, please. Um, what we found was that we need to begin with adults. Um, that most uh, most training materials um, and 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 efforts don't take the adult into the account. But yet, as you've heard, it's the adult's mindset that makes the difference all the way along. And unless we change, children aren't going to change. Um, or if, unless we know what the things that we do that make a difference are, we're not going to necessarily do them. So our curriculum begins with you, begins with adults. And I think that's really, uh, and it shows how important each of these skills are in your own life. Then you feel it in your heart, you just don't know it in your mind uh, because we don't learn things unless we uh, know them in our hearts and minds. Um, and then it's much easier to figure out how to create the right environment to promote these skills in children. Um, so then we wondered, well, yes, okay, we know all of that, but how do we make that um, turn into behavior change? Um, you know, it's, I always think of uh, good intentions like, yes, I'm going on a diet or yes, I'm going to exercise every day, but we don't do it. Um, and so who, who has done the best research so we looked at just not only the research on children, but who's done the best research on ensuring that what we want to do, we actually do. And interestingly enough, if you move to the next uh, slide, you'll see that we found the research of Gabriel Otengen. And she's found um, really probably surprising to most of you all that positive thinking doesn't end up in, in doing something. You know, everything was um, just believe it, you know, um, fake it till you make it, those sorts of things. Um, that doesn't work. You, if you fake it till you make it, you already feel like you've achieved your goal and you don't really deal with the obstacles. And uh, she's found that you need to set your goal and then look at the obstacles uh, and then uh, come up with a plan, uh, an if-then plan to deal with them. This is the research of Peter Golwitzer, in a, uh, uh, who's her husband in addition to Gabriel Otengen of NYU's research. So it's a four-step process that's called WHOOP, which is your wish to change your uh, outcome, how you'll feel if you make that change, your obstacle. It's really important to put that obstacle in you, not in someone else. It's not just my husband who won't do things. It's not just my kids. It's the obstacle in you. Um, and um, because you can't change other people, you can only change yourself. Um, so how are you gonna create a better environment for the people in your life to behave differently? Not how are you gonna make them do something? Um, so uh, the obstacle and then an if-then plan. And we do this throughout our training. If you move to the next slide, Gabriel has had seven years of trying this out and we've incorporated. Now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Aaron Ramsey. Um, I have had the joy of working with Aaron almost nine years um, at the 
uh, first the Families and Work Institute and now at the Bezos Family Foundation. She's one of the most gifted trainers um, whom I've ever met and it's such a joy to be working with her. Erin? Thanks, Ellen. Uh, and thanks to Build for having us. Ellen, you've really covered a lot of material there, so I'm glad that you get to take a minute. Um, so I'm charged with just for a couple minutes, I'm not going to speak for long because our partners in New Hampshire and Nevada really will be able to show you how they're using the resources, which um, they're much better at explaining um, what they've done and how they've done it. But a few things that Ellen and I did when we started to bring our free training resources out and our supplemental materials is to really work, and I know that this is one of the missions of BUILD, so it fits nicely uh, to this group, is to really break down the silos in early childhood and even elementary ed, and how do we bring people together, not just to meet and talk about collaboration, but to really take action on it. And our learning journey really has provided that for lots of states and lots of communities. So we focus on a cross-sector approach because the way that we've set the training materials are they're for teachers and early educators, but for parents and for other community leaders. So um, it's about aligning a system within your community or your state. And I can't wait for New Hampshire and Nevada to talk about how they've done it. As Ellen said, we begin with adults. We kind of look at it as an adult intervention with positive outcomes for children. And while we do that and the way that the, the modules are set up, um, it's really fun, it's experiential, and lots of people refer to it as transformational and inspiring because so many of us don't take time to think about ourselves and what those life skills mean for ourselves and then how do we promote them in children or the people that we love and care for. And it redefines parent engagement because a lot of communities and a lot of states will bring early educators and teachers together with families to go through the 16 hour series together. Let's talk about kindergarten transition. In fact, um, there's another reference to Providence, Rhode Island. They had a $3 million I-3 grant from the Department of Ed to offer mine in the making to all the families with children entering kindergarten. And they had huge results around parent engagement and what that meant. Um, they, they found that parents felt more empowered at home to help their children with schoolwork. They felt more comfortable engaging in the school setting. And a huge, I think over 80% of their participants were Spanish speaking families. Um, and teachers were more developmentally appropriate once they went through um, that. And they had a whole bunch of other findings that we can add, uh, build, compose for you. So we're all over the country now, and we're really excited to be expanding and bringing in, in the how of learning, not the what to teach. So our modules really underline any curriculum people are using. It just brings the brain science, like Ellen said, in new and everyday ways and gives a nice foundation for families and educators to understand how we learn um, and not necessarily what to teach. Um, and so we will be releasing some online asynchronous modules that we'll talk about at the end coming in 2021 as well. So it's a surround strategy, the way it's set up. And again, um, Jackie and Celissa and Marty can tell you more about it. If we were doing things in person, it's a three day train the trainer. You'll hear them talk about their institutes. Now we're implementing those online over a two week period for two and a half hours a day. We're just doing our first one right now in Mississippi and it's going very well. So you could build that training capacity online. Um, all the materials are turnkey. So the facility, it's a one, one level train the trainer. So you train, uh, you do an institute to train facilitators, then they're able to bring into as many uh, teachers and families and community members as they want. There's no licensing fee or it's very, we've developed it in a way that it's totally accessible and affordable and sustainable. Um, so there's eight modules, they're about two hours. A bag, that was the Providence Rhode Island study and we'll make sure that you get that. We've talked about the surround strategy. So we not only surround strategy around cross-sector engagement, but resources that we've developed. And I'm gonna share a few of them, but I know that our partners are gonna share what they've done with them, which is much more interesting. Ellen and I took um, 89 children's books and matched them to the life skills by, by age. And we made sure that it was a partnership with First Book. If you don't know First Book Marketplace, you'll wanna know that it's a great um, reduced marketplace for children's literature and other resources. 
So every book we chose is in English and Spanish and offered on the first book marketplace, but you get the books anywhere if you're not a member of first book. And we created these tip sheets that are free and downloadable we, without any advertising. We're, we're pushing probably a million downloads, not including all of the ones that were printed. But you use these, they, they, they mark with the book. And we find from programs, it's a great uh, bridge between school and home. It would be great now with all this virtual learning. And it's just taking the book and, and promoting the life skill. The next thing that we created are called skill building opportunities. Um, you can find these sheets, thanks Patrice, at mindinthemaking.org. And you'll see them on there. They're on all in English and Spanish. So the next one was the skill building opportunities. You can switch this slide, Jonathan. And what we were trying to do here is to create um, questions, the most commonly asked questions that parents ask. And to and many of them are really just normal milestones that show good development, but some but we often create a problem around it. And so we took those and used the research and created tips on how to create or how to make these challenges into an opportunity. And we're creating hopefully a whole opportunity mindset shift within the way that we parent and teach our children. And this is one of the first steps. Again, these are totally free. You can download them from Mind the Making. So now I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague, Dan, and he's gonna share with you about Vroom. Hello, everyone. I'm gonna talk briefly, because as Aaron said earlier, I'm really looking forward to hearing from our partners and how they're using both Vroom and Mind in the Making in their communities. Um, so just briefly with Vroom, just to start off, uh, just science is at the heart of Vroom. And with Vroom, we really believe that families and caregivers are a child's number one brain builder. Uh, babies are born ready to learn and caregivers already have what it takes to help them. And the everyday moments spent with a child can help their brain grow strong and even a few minutes count. Children love to learn from the caring adults in their life and that time together gives them a strong start. So Vroom is based on the science that we've heard earlier and three core scientific principles are really at the heart of uh, the tips that Vroom provides to caregivers and those three um, science principles are positive adult child relationships matter, back and forth interactions are key, and then finally life skills are built in the early years. So that's the foundational elements behind um, the program. So the brain building basics and the room tips encourage caregivers to build their child's brain by making eye contact, chatting from birth on, stretching out moments with follow-up comments or questions and more. So we know that these five actions are really the key to growing a child's brain power. So the Vroom Brain Building Basics are a science-based guide or tool that any adult can use to help children learn and develop. And you'll see some explanations under what those five brain building basics are um, in the slide. So this is really what the heart of Vroom is right now. So Vroom Tips <clears throat> are really an expansion of the Brain Building Basics. Uh, the collection of over a thousand tips is the cornerstone of the free Vroom tools and resources. So those tips promote brain development for children ages zero to five, developing language, early literacy, numeracy, and executive function skills. So each tip, it's important to know, is written to be age appropriate and does not require a lot of time or any money to complete. The activities are meant to be fun and joyful, turning something that might be mundane or even chore-like into a positive moment of interaction and an opportunity for bonding. And most importantly, each tip includes a brainy background, which explains the science behind each activity so caregivers can see how they're supporting their child's brain development. So the tips are available in several different forms, including a physical deck of cards, printable PDFs, through the Vroom app, and through the Vroom by Text service. They're available in both English and Spanish. So just to summarize, the Vroom tips give caregivers effective, easy ways to promote learning and bond with their child. Vroom makes it easy for caregivers to create connections that help their children thrive now and in the future. And then the Vroom tips help caregivers build their child's life skills. Vroom tips help caregivers turn everyday routines into brain building moments with their children and children learn best when they're having fun. So you can see for yourself how Vroom tips are fun and easy to use. The great thing about this resource is you can start using it now. Um, you can download the Vroom app from the app store for iOS or Android. Um, you can search Vroom from there and it should pop up as, as one of the top three choices. Um, you can sign up for the text service or share with your partners the information on the text service by texting Vroom to 48258. Um, 
in addition to the technological ways you can get room, the room website has a variety of materials, um, PDF packets, um, a lot of different um, kind of curated lists of tips for providers. Um, on our website, we also now have um, certain selected room tips in up to 15 languages. Um, so I think that's really important for a lot of us that are focused on equity work in terms of building that bridge um, to caregivers that um, language is often a barrier. So up to 15 languages, I think, is a resource a lot of our partners have found is really helpful. Um, so that's the quick overview of Vroom that I wanted to provide. Uh, but having said that, I do want to turn it over to our partners to dive in and, and talk about what it looks like actually in the community level. Dan and folks, before we turn it over, I'd just like to ask a quick question. Dan, are you seeing the Vroom tips and the products in there have a multi audience, like in terms of um, uh, home based childcare, family, friend, and neighbor, as well as families, parents, and um, maybe center based folks? So the audience for this material is wider than um than you'd think right like talk just for a minute about that yeah i mean it really is meant to be a, a really adaptable flexible resource that fits into um pretty much any environment you can think of but you do see family child care being a, <clears throat> a really impactful place we're seeing a lot of um, interest in the healthcare space um the last few years um, we have a pilot that was going on in colorado in a tanf office um, where they were using room tips there. So now a lot of places where you're you're a kind of un, unanticipated messengers are starting to use it. So it's very flexible. Um, the tips are, you know, primarily for a caregiver to interact with child, but there are thousands of places where that happens. And there are mm -hmm. thousands of places where that interaction can take place and we can really focus on child development in a way that that we're not doing in many cases now. So um, and you'll hear, I think, more at the state level of how those really innovative partnerships come to life. That's great. I, I'd like to encourage our participants to keep tracking your ideas and thinking. And if you have ideas about audiences we haven't mentioned or how you might, you know, craft this to work in your state or territory, please let's fire up the chat box and get some ideas in there, especially after we talk to New Hampshire and Nevada. And at this point, let's do hand it on to New Hampshire. This will probably give us a lot of ideas, but start to generate some uh, creative thinking in the chat box as we move forward. Okay, Jackie and Celeste. Hi, thank you, Debbie. Uh, how do you do? I'm Jackie Cowell from Early Learning New Hampshire. Uh, Celissa Hoyt, my colleague, and I are delighted to be here today with you. Real quickly, Early Learning New Hampshire, we're a private nonprofit that works statewide in New Hampshire. We, um, we work on uh, early childhood education as well as early childhood systems building. We mainly support programs. We raise awareness about the importance of the early years so that uh, folks think of it as a public good. And we build par public private partnerships and we champion change. I'm not gonna go into all the detail, but it's the raise awareness that we're talking about today where we um, present, uh, we have a PowerPoint using a lot of the neuroscience um, that had, Ellen had talked about, uh, children, the bedrock of the Granite State. We talk about that with state community leaders, and now we're going to be moving on to more community-based um, uh, leaders as well. And we uh, promote room and mind in the making, uh, families, programs, employers, communities, to turn those shared moments into brain-building moments. One of the things that we do in New Hampshire very purposely is we talk about both the deep science of mind in the making, as well as the broad application of it for uh, affecting direct parent or grandparent action, caregiver action with Vroom. So just real quickly, um, our lesson we learned in um, New Hampshire, first of all, is to persevere, don't give up. Uh, it was in 2014 when we first heard about Vroom and Mind in the Making, Aaron Ramsey um, had come and done a terrific talk uh, in New Hampshire about Mind in the Making, and we were simply having dinner with her sort of talking about our worry about um, does the public really understand how young children learn? And you know what uh, Ellen had referred to is this idea that they're an empty mess vessel that you pour 30 million words into. We were worried about that. Aaron told us about an article that um, Ellen and Jackie Bezos had just written in the Huffington Post about exactly 
um, the worry about um, the messaging and how people really understand um, early childhood development. She mentioned Dr. Pat Cool earlier. She also mentioned uh, it in the article. She mentioned Kathy Hirsch Pasek. Um, she told us about all these really terrific folks who are doing great messaging to help folks understand the importance of early childhood development. So in 2015, we partnered uh, at, with the Bezos Family Foundation to think about how could we bring these national level speakers to New Hampshire so that our New Hampshire folks could, could hear about it. And the reason I say 100 year here in the early childhood event in the past, we had been sending one or two business leaders to those wonderful Ready Nation conferences where they come back so inspired, but it was one or two a year. We figured, could we figure out a way to bring the national level speakers to New Hampshire? And we had over 300 people there. We partnered with our premier business um, organizations, as well as our New Hampshire Department of Education superintendents teachers and principals came. It really was an amazing event that people still talk about today. Then from that event, where we introduced Vroom and Mind in the Making to a very large audience, as well as a lot of other concepts of development, um, we had, interestingly, in 2016 and 2017, right after that, great interest, mainly from our public health both um, uh, department, maternal and child health, as well as some private funders, uh, such as the Endowment for Health. We also had the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation. So we had a real interest all of a sudden, and, and it was really exciting. Uh, we were able to put on some community, those three-day community facilitator institutes, we'll talk about that in a second, and our Department of Ed. As New Hampshire was starting to think about applying for a 2019 preschool development grant, birth through five planning grant, it was the Department of Ed that was pushing, let's, let's really do something to help families with the serve and return, that back and forth interaction we've heard so much about and, um, and the mind in the making. And so that ended up in our preschool development grant, planning grant. So then um, lesson number two was in addition to doing this and our Child Care Aware of New Hampshire had a, had a grant through the Child Care Aware of America with Bezos Family Foundation. So a lot of us were doing different things, but what we learned, um, in terms of sustainability and getting it really focused is we wanted to coordinate all these efforts statewide. So in 2019, um, we were able to partner with the Bezos Family Foundation uh, to fund that statewide coordination and we hired Celissa Hoyt very happily for, for us and she'll be talking to you soon about what she's been doing. So again, Vroom and Mind in the Making were not only included in our planning grant, they were included in our three-year successful grant for PDG renewal and implementation. So 2020 through 2022, it gives us that time, that ability to really bring it out um, statewide, uh, locally, and regionally. So Lisa will talk about that. And so now here we are in 2020, and as part of our preschool development grant, um, we wrote a strategic plan for early childhood and for New Hampshire, came out in June of this year. And again, room and mind in the making are included. It's that belief that you need both, that deep science, bringing it out and, and helping people uh, and, um, understand it, as well as that practical application of room. So we've been really pleased about that. So what we've been doing again is we are embedding room and mind in the making throughout our early childhood systems building efforts. We're building uh, in New Hampshire, a brand new web tool for families to find out what's available for them in four different areas. Um, they're able to find out, you know, why we might wanna stay in or, or, or come to New Hampshire as a young family. What are, are the basic services out there for you? If you happen to be facing a crisis or your child is facing a risk, what, can, what are the services out there for you? And more about uh, promoting child development. So again, we've embedded room and mind and making in this new tool as well. So, Celissa. Thank you, Jackie. So I'm glad to be here to talk a little bit more about specifically what we're doing in New Hampshire. And I wanna start by saying this work is so rewarding. I help support the work that's happening on the ground um, work that's happening locally and regionally as well as statewide. And important to note that some of this work was underway before I was brought on board. So some of our partners were already really um, embedding the work, uh, embedding the resources from Mind in the Making and Room into their work. 
Um, one of the things we did first in New Hampshire was to, um, to hold these Mind in the Making three-day community facil facilitator institutes. We trained more than 80 facilitators um, statewide. We held these institutes in regions throughout the state. And we did this very intentionally because we wanted these community facilitators to bring this information back and these trainings back to their community and really helping to um, take that deep dive in the science on each of the seven essential life skills. I wanna share one quick story about how one of our community facilitators started um, integrating this work into what she did. Um, we have a um, family support specialist at the Correctional Facility for Women in New Hampshire who started sharing Mind in the Making and running these modules. And when she got to the first topic about focus and self-control, one of the moms shared that she, of an eight-year-old daughter, shared that her daughter was having some trouble with anger. And, um, and she hadn't seen her daughter in three years, but she has Skype privileges. And what she did was use what she learned about focus and self-control and doing WHOOP goal setting. And she actually did that with her daughter on Skype and it made a difference. And what a wonderful thing for that mom to have this concrete tool to help her daughter. On the next slide, I want to, um, the next two slides. Um, this one, I just wanna show how um, our partners can integrate Room and Mind in the Making on their website. We encourage our partners to, at the very least, add a link to both Room and Mind in the Making websites and actually the Facebook pages, which are wonderful, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Or even better yet, add an entire page and really highlight the wonderful resources and entice people to take action. On the next slide, you will see um, a completely different approach with Room and Mind in the Making. Um, the State Early Learning Alliance is our shared service initiative providing extensive resources for early childhood programs. It's really deep content, a one-stop shop for them um, to find best practice tools that are focused on engaging families, teachers work in the classroom, program management. And so this is an example of creating um, links to very specific content to put information, put these resources at people's fingertips. And what I want to note is that um, both Room and Mind in the Making organize the materials in a number of different ways. So if you're a library or you, you want to build literacy skills, you can very purposely connect to those room tips or, um, or that skill building. Um, so we love that about this resource. I'm gonna just show you, this is an example of how wonderful the resource is for libraries. And that libraries first and foremost, give them Ellen's book, give them multiple copies of Ellen's book, and then help them incorporate these resources in if they do um, story time with children, which many are doing still virtually um, due to these unprecedented times. They can incorporate, they can read a children's book and then point families to um, the book tips that are on the Mind in the Making website and do um, share a room tip as well. Um, one of our head starts, a number of our head starts actually integrate all of these resources into pretty much everything they do. And so they share the information when they enroll a new family, they incorporate it into the classroom work that teachers are doing, they incorporate it into home visiting sessions, um, parent teacher conferences. There's just so many ways that um, you can access these resources in your in your business, in your agency. Um, on the next slide, I wanna share a little bit about one of our partners. Um, they incorporate uh, all of these resources in a number of ways, including they have a Happy Tra Trails Wellness Club. They recently had an event where they were um, sharing room information and mind in the making information. They were highlighting healthy eating and helping support families in planning um, healthy eating. And they tied that specifically to one of the skill building opportunities on trying new food. And then they run a Happy Trails um, virtual story time. And Danielle, you see here, she starts with a children's story that she reads, and then she shifts into supports and guidance and strategies for the parents and the grandparents and the caregivers. She reads a room tip. She talks about the brainy background related to that. Um, and then also using um, Mind in the Making tools as well. On the next slide, um, I, this just will showcase one of our um, partners in New Hampshire. A number of, the, our, of our partners um, do new baby bags in their communities and our friends at United Way of the Greater Nashua area just recently had a virtual baby shower and then families could pick up a new baby bag, um, which included some of the resources you see highlighted there. 
And then most recently, I've actually learned about one of our regions that is arranging to have groom postcards and flyers um, distributed to parents when they pick up new, their new baby birth certificates. And I thought, what a wonderful, wonderful idea. Um, on the next slide, um, this just highlights, I'm not gonna read all of these things, um, but we do a lot of work with early childhood programs because this is a great place to reach many, many families. And so our goal is really to bring these resources to early childhood programs in the places they go, the places they connect, like our shared service work and Child Care Aware, um, to help point them to um, Room and Mind in the Making Facebook pages are a wonderful place to get a quick bite size um, bit of information um, about these resources that you've heard about. And then I have a, uh, one more quick story to share. Um, one of the programs that was promoting this within their agency, they were enrolling in, um, a new nine month old. And this was a dad who was just taking custody of his, um, of his child who he'd only met once um, due to mom's drug related issues. And so dad was actually terrified. He shared that with the director that he's, you know, going to be raising this child and he's only met him once. And when the director was sharing information about um, Mind in the Making and Vroom and they did a presentation actually at their center, he actually said, I think I can do this. And so, you know, I think again about what a gift it is for um, families and grandparents and people raising young children, having young, um, young children who are important to them to learn about these resources. And then my last two slides are really connected to our um, lesson number five, which is make it actionable in bite-sized pieces. We do have partners who wanna go deeply into this work. And then we have partners who, um, it really helps if we can point them to a few things at a time. We were very fortunate to have some grant money through the Preschool Development Grant to um, print materials and distribute them statewide, flyers, postcard, posters, et cetera. Um, and then again, just sort of summarizing some of the things I've talked about, help work with partners and help them see what is a good fit for the way that they work with families and how can you point them to the specific resources that will really support that. And then on the last slide, um, just a few more examples. Virtual story time is actually really easy to do and you can do it live on Facebook and record it so people can access it anytime and include those um, resources for parents that are available to you through Room and Mind in the Making. Do a room tip on every home visiting visit. That's a really wonderful way. These resources are strength-based. They send the message, you've got what it takes. You can turn everyday moments into these powerful brain building moments. And then the last um, thing that I wanted to share is we've done a little bit of this and we plan to do more of this in 2021. And that is to promote these resources with HR administrators. So they share these with their employees as a really wonderful HR benefit to support them as parents and grandparents. So I think, you know, to sum up, we want our partners to know we can help them take a few easy steps quickly, and we can also help them go deeper and plan that surround strategy that you heard a, a little bit about earlier. Um, so thank you very much. We were happy to share some of our work in New Hampshire. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Marty Elquist, and I am the Department Director for the Children's Cabinet Supporting Early Education and Development. Um, as Debbie introduced me, I'm also the Chair of Nevada's Early Childhood Advisory Council. So a little bit of background of how Mind in the Making and Vroom came to the great state of Nevada. Uh, the Nevada Early Childhood Advisory Council began our strategic planning process back in 2017. And there are many other planning efforts that are going along at the same time. And all of them had one thing in common that we really needed to change the narrative. What we were saying about the importance of brain development, much like Ellen was saying, it just wasn't sticking. You know, was, um, folks were like, yeah, yeah, it's important, but really not along the lines of to make deep investment, you know, the return on investment argument, we, we would use that, but we really needed something that would change the culture, change the narrative of how we view uh, supporting children's development. And we needed it across all audiences, parents, our uh, policymakers, our early um, learning providers, our business leaders. And so we, took the work that was happening with Las Vegas Clark County Library District, who um, 
uh, had a, a staff member trained by Aaron uh, to deliver the mine in the making modules and to hold the institutes. Uh, there was an, an institute held in Las Vegas and the children's cabinet had a couple of staff members that attended that training. And our hope was then to take that information and start embedding it in our services. Um, but being the chair of the Nevada Early Childhood Advisory Council, I also took that information back to the council along uh, with some of the work that United Way of Northern Nevada and the Sierras Read by Grade 3 campaign. Uh, we had a facilitator, Steve Greeley, who is incredibly important in Nevada's story because he helped make the connection with um, Aaron and Ellen to, to really turn our vision, which I'll go into next, into reality here in Nevada. Uh, so changing that the message and changing the dialogue was much a part of United Way's Read by Grade 3 campaign, and uh, which was largely focused on community awareness and uh, awareness about brain development. We were also looking for something that could be embedded uh, throughout existing programs and across community partners. Um, being sensitive to uh, not, you know, not something new, not some, in addition to this is a new hot thing. No, we needed something that could be incorporated into existing programming. And so as a result, uh, the Mind in the Making Room was embedded across all three areas of the Nevada Early Childhood Advisory Council strategic plan. And those three areas are families and community, uh, early learning, and fa uh, family and child health. Our vision is and was is still is that Nevada will become the state that leads the nation in providing support uh, for families with young children and that we will use early learning brain science to address school readiness and family engagement. Um, we were really excited about mine in the making um, in the in in Broome that we could provide science based guidance and really uh, change the conversation and to share that as a tool uh, across family service organizations. And as Ellen said, it starts with adults. Um, we knew that we had to transform professional practice and in all settings where, where children and families are served, um, including pediatrician offices and including WIC and um, uh, uh, our TANF offices. So our approach is that we would have Mind in the Making Institutes to create a coordinated um, trainer cadre. We are really interested in looking at having trainers in every county across the state of Nevada and being really strategic with that approach, uh, starting with neighborhoods that had uh, children uh, high density of children uh, living in areas of poverty, as well as Nevada is very rural, uh, looking at uh, more of deserts where, you know, there are children, but not a lot of services and making sure that the services that were provided in those areas, that uh, we do have a trainer there that could uh, help deliver the modules, as well as be a pickup spot for broom materials. And so with that in mind, we embarked on um, having, we had one Mind in the Making uh, Institute and then unfortunately COVID hit. We're uh, a little bit, uh, for we're not as advanced as uh, New, Mex or New Hampshire at this point, but um, we, we're very thankful that when we pitched our vision to the Basos Family, Found Family Foundation, that they uh, agreed that they, they liked the vision, they liked the approach. We are very thankful and we received funding in January of 2020. Um, and then we all know what happened with COVID. So uh, we uh, scrambled a little bit, but now we're pulling ourselves back together and uh, rejuvenating our trainer cadre. You know, where are we making sure that we're now rolling back out our community-based trainings and uh, I think the most important thing that you know we know in Nevada is that we, we want the trainings to be delivered by trusted messengers, messengers. And we know that again, the importance of having trainers in every county is that those are people that live in those communities and there are people that um, that 
they trust. And so we're really focusing on local people to become part of the Mind in the, Maker, Mind in the Making trainer cadre. Another thing that we think is really important is that those trainers are supported and that we have network calls to discuss their challenges and successes and, and you know, what are their suggestions to advancing the cause. Though the trainer meetings are just beginning again and uh, we're beginning to reincorporate uh, that activity in our approach. We also want to train community partner agencies to embed the room materials in all of their programming and to streamline the ordering process and ac access to the room assets. Uh, we're very fortunate that Vroom and Mind in the Making is highly supported by our child care and development administrator and we are able to use our child care and development funds to develop our Vroom assets. Um, finally, our Vroom marketing we are using a combination of traditional and social media uh, to promote a large scale use of room. And we were fortunate too that we have a private donor that really loves the concept of mind in the making in room and uh, gave us additional money to push that marketing out even further um, through, uh, a, I'm not a marketing person, but through uh, Google, uh, a marketing campaign and, um, and, and avenues that are CCDF dollars and our gracious support from the Bezos Family Foundation, um, it was not included in those two funding opportunities. Through our community trainings, um, our partner trainings on Vroom, we are helping community partners really embed the materials and and much like the children's cabinet, we provide services statewide. And so we assist our community partners in embedding the materials like we have at the children's cabinet. We're including our room materials in um, all of our food bank bags that we have going out to um, families in need. Throughout the state of Nevada, every newborn baby, their family goes home with room materials in their pink packet. It is a packet that Immunize Nevada gives to every newborn, uh, families of a newborn baby. It includes information, their immunization booklet, um, but also does now include room materials. So that's really exciting. We have uh, MCO partners, um, uh, managed healthcare partners that are including room information in dental screenings, health clinics. So as they're out there doing those services uh, for families, they're also including room materials. Our resource and referral service um, includes room tip cards and referral packets. And our QIS program, Quality Rating and Improvement System program includes information on Vroom and Mind in the Making to all of their provider locations. Our parent engagement workshops, we've included Mind in the Making Brain Science. We've adapted our curriculum to include information on Mind in the Making into all of our curriculum. We've done the similar in all of our provider training as well and that's licensed child care provider training. In our vision too, we also want to have a coordinated uh, evaluation across the state of Nevada of the short-term and long-term uh, impact. And our community partners, when they attend the institutes and utilize room materials, they agree that they're going to be a part of that evaluation. So short term is largely outputs or satisfaction, but long term evaluation, we really want to work with our community partners to assess how did they use Mind in the Making and Vroom in their delivery of their services. And really our long term then is to monitor the impact on our school readiness um, assessments. Nevada does currently use Bergantz as a screener for our kindergarten readiness. And we really hope to uh, utilize and see differences in those data moving forward, as well as our third grade MAPS assessments. We do want to, and we will provide an annual report of the impact 
And we are continually right now in the uh, revision of our implementation plan based on evaluation data. Um, right now, we have minimal evaluation data due to COVID, but we have plenty of qualitative feedback from partners. Um, and we know that we have to add, you know, different activities due to COVID and are in the, the process of modifying our plan. And that is all I have for the state of Nevada. And I really appreciate the opportunity to share the work and um, look forward to implementation over the next three years. Thank you so much for that great um, discussion about how these materials can be um, used and of service within states. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, I'd like to go back to two things. One is that we want to give, I think, Aaron a chance to talk with us a little bit about what's coming and what's next in the work. But before we get to that discussion, I was wondering if any of you could address how the materials are brought to the adults in the program um, to orient and think about what you're saying and the material and the research. You know, can you envision a dry college course, you know, where you're talking about it? But I think you have a very different approach than that with how you orient the adults to these materials and to thinking about um, them moving forward. Could someone address that a little bit? Let me start with an overview and then Dan and Aaron will jump in. Um, we've taken the surround strategy really means a sectorial approach. So we've worked in different ways with different sectors and who the key spokespeople are in those sectors. So um, for example, you mentioned colleges and universities. We created uh, 42 videos that are meant for colleges and universities. Uh, they're longer than the videos that you typically see if you heard us give a presentation, which are usually two to five minutes. These are seven minutes maybe, but they're, um, they're a way of bringing research into teaching classes that people wouldn't normally uh, have. Uh, we have a book study, uh, the state of Maryland with its Race to the Top grant um, did book, book clubs. And um, so we have a book reading guide as a way of sharing with adults. The county of Fairfax, Virginia had all of the principals in the county reading a mind in the making in a book study group before they decided to implement it across the county. So there are different approaches for different groups. Some people mentioned pediatrics um, and we've, uh, we've actually taken, it took practically as long, Jackie, as it took to get to New Hampshire to, create, to work with Mount Sinai who is our partner on this effort, but we, we began actually in 2011, 2012, uh, by, uh, off and on. By 2019, we, act, we have a curriculum that's online that's free for every pediatrician who uh, in his, his or her residency training program learns about the science of development. And so it's called Keystones of Development and I put the link in the chat box. Um, there are 210 training teaching hospitals that teach pediatric residents. We are in 61% of them now with this free resource. So we're trying to do a, it's in the water, it's in the air kind of an approach uh, to, to this. With Mind in the Making in the modules, um, every module begins with the adult. It doesn't begin with kids. It begins with uh, how is perspective taking, how is taking on challenges depending on the module, important in your life, not your kid's life, but your life. And you look at it from that vantage point and then uh, like a third of the time is devoted to the adult. Then you go to, the, um, to what's important uh, in children. But by that time you've seen, wow, this is important in my thriving in my own life. I'm going to uh, make sure that my kids get this. Because I think if we just, it was more blah, 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 like everything else is blah, blah, blah. But there's a lot of stuff out there and, and needs to, it needs to really touch us. And, and these skills transcend age. So, um, you know, both Mind in the Making and the book tips and the skill building opportunities. We're doing new skill building opportunities with First Book where they're going to be um, 
uh, there'd be kind of a club where you get one a week uh, with a challenge and a way to turn that from an adversity mindset. An adversity mindset is it'll never work. We're studying this right now. So this is not just made up. We were looking in the way that Carol Dweck looked at growth mindset. We're beginning to study what an opportunity mindset is, but we're looking at uh, adversity mindset, which is it'll never work. I, I've already tried, nothing works. Uh, things will never change to seeing every challenge that you have with the child as an opportunity for you to learn more for the child uh, for you to create an opportunity for the child to uh, to improve. So um, there'll be a series of 40 tips that go out on a weekly basis for the school year um, coming next year. Uh, so anyway, the, Dan, why don't you talk about the approach at, at Broom? Yeah, I mean, it really just comes down to those trusted messengers being the core of the strategy, which you heard a lot about in both Nevada and New Hampshire. It is connecting with those trusted messengers in different settings and giving them a general overview of what Broom is, which is pretty much what you heard today, and then thinking through going from ideas to actually actions and getting to the how. If you can get someone to the how, then, then you have a chance of, of Broom really kind of taking off in a setting. And for people to get to the how is not hard, right? It gets them, there's the barriers to entry are so low um, that you can get to 10 ideas really quick. And then it comes down to like, okay, which ones, okay, start somewhere um, because you can brainstorm for a long time and then pick a setting, um, work with some partners and then build your implementation strategy from there. That's, that's the general answer. And I'd love to hear from either Nevada or New Hampshire if they wanted to provide more specific examples. Yeah, this is Marty. I absolutely agree. And um, through our our vision pitch to the Vasos Family Foundation, we outlined um, our first couple of community partners that we were going to um, to work with and identify. And I'm really excited that uh, pr one primary partner, the Library Association, the State Library Association, um, is working. We're working with all the librarians across the state of Nevada to um, incorporate Mind in the Making and the skill building stories in all the all story times. Um, working through a little bit of potential copyright with the book issues, but you know we'll get there. There's a little bit of concern there. Um, so, uh, but we'll overcome those challenges. Um, so yeah, that's just one good example of identifying the community partner and having a specific strategy not to overwhelm and what's gonna work with each one of the community partners and what's easily, what's most easily to implement. Thank you, Marty, for filling in a perfect example. Let's move forward to Aaron. I, you wanna say a few things to give us a few more ideas and what's next for um, Mind in the Making and Room. Can you just share a little bit of uh, information? Sure. So at the foundation, we're constantly working on how can we get this research out, make it tangible, but keep fidelity uh, to the researcher's work. And so with Vroom, if, you know, Dan clearly showed you that you can get it by the app, the text or in print and use trusted messengers because everything we do is relationship based. That's why it's really important that you get those trusted relation or trusted messengers. And then of course, with Mind in the Making, we don't even like to call it training because it's so relationship-based. We refer to it as a learning journey so that everybody learns together is really our approach, including the facilitator. So the next phase is with Mind in the Making, you know, you do the Institute or the Institute online and you can email us and it's a, it's a conversations and it's a process like Jackie showed. I can't believe it was 2014 that we were having dinner. So Things take time, but you know, like you say, perseverance. So our next phase now um, was to really get Mind in the Making and the eight modules out to the general population virtually in a way that anybody can go through them. It's referred to in the online learning as asynchronous. You can go through them alone at any time you want. And so with the University of Washington um, at Cultivate Learning and Early Ed U, we are creating that and we're gonna be launching it uh, this late winter, early 2021. And we're hoping we'll have another session, one to learn and talk more about Ellen and Ellen and I's work around opportunity mindset with you and also share our asynchronous resources with you and get some feedback and learn together. That's how we do it. Ellen didn't talk about it today, but we believe in civic science. So it's a back and forth all the time. Um, so that's just a little prompt to tell you that there's gonna be an additional resource that's free. 
and we want to um, access your expertise to do that. And we are totally available to talk about systems alignment and funding streams from your states that might help you support with these two free resources, basically. Or if your state is interested, um, I think um, our leadership at the foundation wants us to continue to do the kind of work that we've done in that you've heard about today in Nevada and New Hampshire. So if your state is interested, uh, get in touch with us. Um, and for the next event we do with you, we hope some of you will come back and tell us how um, the online uh, asynchronous modules could be useful to you because I think we're, we'll be rolling those out in January and we really would like to partner with some of you um, in, if you're interested. Well, what an invitation. We are going to have a follow-up meeting to this one and we'll make sure to reach out to all of you specifically who signed up um, for this uh, session today. Um, I'd like to thank Ellen Aaron, Dan, Jackie, Celissa, and Marty for taking the time to prepare materials to come um, for today and to come and chat with you about such an exciting and wonderful initiative for state and territories to use. Um, we're really looking forward to our continued collaboration together between BUILD and, and the Basis Foundation and um, to hear more and more. I think that you all are on a fast track to developing um, a lot of materials that are going to be of great interest to the field. We appreciate you spending time with us today. Thank you everyone for coming today and we'll see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>